Shut up and sit down. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Third Shift, episode 329. And if you know, you know. It's a very fancy, a very special, a very prolific episode of Third Shift. It's the yearly tradition. It's our games of the year. And of course, I'm your host for this grand event. I am your funky leader, the greatest man who's ever lived. It's me, it's Matt, and along with me, my co-host with the mo-host, it's the light bearer, the light bringer, the light bearer, bringer, the beast master, Third Shift. It's Eric. He's here with me to talk about the best games that we played this year. And you know what? We always have a gimmick. Two years ago, was I had a secret tie and you had to get an ascot going. Last year, I grabbed a hat. It was put a hat on day. This year, the gimmick is you grab a trophy and you hold the trophy up like you're, like you're presenting the award to, boom, grab something. I got a shiny cactuar. Look at this guy. He is shiny as a mofo. I have a golden Pokemon card. Perfect. That's awesome. That. I like it. Can't, We're both set up it. perfectly for this, yeah. <laughs> but before we get into the actual list, because there's no intro, there's no weeklies, there's no releases, there's no how you doing, there is, though, a plug for the December Shifter Monthly Topic, because the rules for Game of the Year this year were top five plus two honorable mentions. And the Shifter Monthly Topic over on the Patreon, patreon.com slash thirdshiftme, is anything outside of there that you want to talk about. So we got some good stuff over there, some good games we're talking about. And our buddy, our patron, our good friend Steve Cadwallader dropped in some of his honorable mentions outside of the two proper honorable mentions. And I'm going to read them to you right now because he's a good buddy. He's there for us, and he helps us do what we like to do. And his first honorable mention is Elden Ring. He says, this game is really well done, and I don't need to go into the details since it's so well known. I like to enjoy games, and this is just too punishing of a game for my tastes. But this was compelling enough, I put about 20 hours into it. I would have loved a casual clone of this game. And I have a feeling, Steve, Eric and I are both going to talk about this more later in the episode. I think it might happen. I think it might just happen. Next up, he says, Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. The base game is solid Borderlands content. I enjoyed the fantasy mix and the continuing improvements to gameplay. The collectibles like dice were cool, the overworld was a sweet mechanic, and the environments were fun and new. The end game just wasn't engaging. The chaos chamber just isn't that fun, and having to grind it over and over again was dull. The DLC also broke my heart. For the same price as Borderlands DLCs, which are usually several new maps and storyline per DLC, this game gave me so very, very little. I've always pre-ordered Ultimate Editions from Gearbox before, but they did me wrong here, and I lost a lot of faith in them over it. Man, I, I know Tiny Tina's Wonderlands is a game I'm not going to talk about later in my list. Maybe maybe Eric will, I don't know. But I didn't even make it to end game, so I can't, I can't even comment, sir. Only time will tell if I finished it, and it's on the list. <laughs> and then he says, one more late edition, as he did just play it, Metal Hellsinger. He says he loves metal music. This game brings some excellent tunes. It's a really neat mechanic to get critical hits if you fire on beat. The music amping up and adding lyrics as you do it feels very rewarding. He made it through a level, and maybe he'll go back. Even though, like Eric, it's a little frustrating doing a shooter on rhythm. It's a lot of kiting around and getting yourself back into it if you fall off the groove. I'm glad to be able to talk about Metal Hellsinger again. It's a game I've not played, but anytime I get to talk about it, and I get to laugh, and I point at the screen and go, ha ha ha, Eric, and he shakes his head just like he's doing right now. It makes me feel good. So thank you, Steve. It's a game I want to love. The music is so good. <laughs> Why? Why can't I just shoot things and let me hear the music and have fun? You know what? Where's the baby-ass baby mode that all the, the podcasters talk about for this game? So I can just turn it on and just shoot people and have badass metal playing in the background. Just give me that. And I will finish this game all the way to its end. I don't care if it's easy. Listening to awesome metal and shooting demons, that's fun. I'll do it. I was just going to say, where's the easy mode? Talk about Elden Ring needs need an easy mode? No, Metal Hill Singer needs an easy that's mode. That's what it needs. That's what we're really talking that's about. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> but that rounds out Steve's honorable mentions. Thank you for sending those in, Steve. Again, patreon.com slash thirdshiftme is where you can find that. And you can find all kinds of other good stuff. Good stuff from your boys here on Third Shift, giving it to you. And speaking of giving it to you, it's time to give you Ooh, our two official time. honorable mentions leading into the top five games of the year. Eric, hit me with one. What you got? I'm hitting you with a surprise one, actually. I got two surprise ones for you. One's going to be an improper chopper, and you're going to be so angry about it, but it's gonna you're going to suck it up. 
but a legitimate <laughs> one for the most part. I'm disgusted I'm, already. And I'm springing it on you right now. It's Final Fantasy VII Crisis Core, man. Because today, just today, came to find out that I'm actually one mission away from the end of the game. But you haven't beat it yet. That's you, but I'm at the end of the game. Away. And it's you're not, not going to get brought up one next mission year. Past. I don't care. It's not by the last mission. <laughs> you, and we already know what happens. So I consider it B. Because it's the mission to the damn Mako reactor where we get Tifa and everybody else involved. So I already know the story. I know it's going to happen. Sure, maybe there'll be like a little bit here and there up to the Mako, re- Mako reactor itself. But guess what? I know what happens after that. So I, I, I know what's going to happen. I'm right there. I'm 80-something percent through the game. I can say it's a goddamn honorable mention because it was a fantastic, fun-ass time, and I loved every minute of it. And I won't mention it next year because there's too many games next year, man. It's going to freaking disappear with all the other stuff, and I don't want it to never get mentioned again because it deserves it. That was bad enough that you're cheating and you're a lying bastard and you're a terrible person. But I'm doubly mad now because you called it a Mako reactor. You can't even say Mako. You can't even say Mako. You have to make up some own, your own stupid air pronunciation purpose. for it. you got to <laughs> make it ridiculous and stupid. <laughs> Final Fantasy. Uh, Maybe so play some Final Fantasy. If horror, everybody horror. else can make up words for all the things in the damn games and the podcasts I listen to, I can do it too. I can do it too. I can just say random weird things that aren't quite right, but... They just say it, and it's okay, and everybody says it. So I get to do it no. and say Mako, Mako, Makoko, Makaneo, Malero, Mako. I do what I want, all right? And let me tell you, this game, it's just so – I've already talked about it. I've already talked about it, so I won't go deep on it. I'm just saying, if you want quick hit fun, this is the title. It's just oh, so munchable. It's just mm, – mm, 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 mm. and then it even does the Barney basic thing of when you get to this last mission, Matt – it goes, hey, this is the last mission in case you're actually confused because you haven't played Final Fantasy Titles before and you don't understand what's about to happen. This is it. Is there anything else you want to do? Like, you should probably not do this and go finish those missions you still have, right? Like, it just it grabs you by the little paw and it says, hey, this is literally it. Go do those missions and have fun first. And I love that. I appreciate that. Because it's it's the type of game it is. It's just it wants you just to go back and do those fun missions, get all the little extras. It even adds in like a little end, not an end game, but like a little end bonus for you and Aerith. And I appreciate it. I don't I don't know if I should say what it is. I won't. But there's a little thing you can do with her that doesn't mean really much of anything. But it's a little a little add on to a little cool moment with her that Zach has that you just you'll never know unless you play the game. Really cool. And it tells you right then and there. And that's it's funny enough because when it takes your hand and tells you to go back, it literally points that very one out. And it goes, hey, and don't you want to do this one cool thing with you know her and like enjoy that before you end the game? You should do it. And then it's like, okay, are you sure? Of course I'm not. Now I want to go do the thing you just showed me. That looks like fun. And maybe there will be a little bonus scene or ending. I don't know yet because I didn't do it. Because I, of course, went, yeah. I'm going to stop right here and finish that up. I almost had it anyway. I was missing, like, one thing to finish it. So I just got to do that, and then I can go beat the game. Hence why it's here in the honorable mentions, because I'm there. I could have probably actually beat it before we did the show, but I was at that point, and I went, no, 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 no. I'm going to finish the, like, I got, like, nine, ten missions left, and then that thing. So I'm like, no, I'm going to do those. I'll wrap them up before I go beat it so I can feel good in my heart. So... Final Fantasy VII, Crisis Core. I knew it was going to be fun. Here we are. I didn't finish finish it, so I can't put it in the top five, because that's illegal. It's an improper chopper. But I got. I can't not let it not be here, because it won't. We, we know the truth. It won't be there next year. There's too much coming out. It's too much. Well, a game that I actually played and beat this year, and and actually 100% completed. Shut up, Eric. Don't even don't even look. Just drink your, drink your little energy drink and drink your little tea. Because it's my time, and I'm going to talk about, just like you did last year, I'm starting off the exact same way you did with Persona 5 Strikers. And I'm putting it on this list for all the reasons that you put it on last year. I mean, 
it starts off not feeling like it, but soon enough you get into that groove. It is more Persona 5, and you are doing all the Persona things with all your Persona friends. Well, I should say most of your Persona friends. All that core cast of characters is there. All the beats are there. Ryuji's being a goof. Anne's doing this. Yusuke's doing that. It's it, it's all there, and it's all right. In all the different places you go, all the different things you do in those different places, it's all Persona 5, like, to the max. It. There's not like, like a dip, like, oh, well, this isn't that interesting, or, oh, the characters aren't that great. Everything is on point. Obviously, the combat system is totally different. Obviously, I, I've talked about it before. I played it on easy mode, but by the end of it, even if I wasn't playing on easy, it would have been, like, second nature. You get used to it. You, you get to see the tells, see the abilities. Once you know what you're looking for, you can do it. Obviously, I played on Merciless mode for a, a good chunk of time. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to say other than just that. I've talked about it a lot on the show. I talked about it a lot on the What You Play in Third Shifts. It's a phenomenal Persona experience. If you love Persona 5, if you love Persona 5 Royal, you should play Persona 5 Strikers because it is just more of that candy that you love so much. It's not as good as Royal. I feel like some of the like the plot points and the monarchs and stuff aren't as memorable as some from the base game. So that's probably why it's just an honorable mention. But if you love the gang and it's been a while since you've seen them, Persona 5 Strikers is it. You will have a ton of fun. It hits all the notes. It's just a great time. Yeah, and the two added characters, you know what I'm saying? Wolf and Sophie, so cool. Would love to see them again. Me and Matt kind of talked about it before. It won't happen, but would love it. It would be so great to see those two characters added in on some other you know, like traditional Persona story. So for that reason, you know, I'll always remember it and have fond memories of it for sure. Mm-hmm. I uh, I just wish it, I just wish it had the side characters like we already said. Just weird. Oh, yeah. Man. Where's Kyle Kami? You know, where'd she go? Where'd she go? Where's Takemi at? You even have a you have, you have a quest objective to go find Takemi and you can't. Mm-hmm. It's just it's a kick in the face to your boy Matt, but all the rest of it is phenomenal. All the Persona beats, it hits them all. You get you get all kinds of new good times with your friends. Just a great game. Yeah, indeed. So the improper chopper, the crazy one. I was looking at. It. I was like, oh, there's like one or two games I didn't mention in our, you know, our shifter monthly topic. But I don't really care about them. You know, I just don't care. What do I actually care about, Matt? Where what deserves a big mention in my life here? Anime, Matt. Honorable mention two. Blue Lock. Your Lie in April. My Hero Academia. Chainsaw Man, Spy and X Family, The Daily Life of the Immortal King, Erased. That's just to name a few. I spent more time, I think, watching anime this year than I did playing video games. I think I did. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I just think I did because of, you know, how it always goes when you're tired and don't want to play games and then you just watch a couple shows and go to bed. But it adds up. And I was looking at some of these games, I go, eh, you know what? I have better memories of these shows than I do of these games. I'm going to mention it. If you don't watch anime, but you've ever loved cartoons at all, like Saturday morning cartoons, had a good time, but you'd love like, more adult stories, or even if you like kids' stories, they have those too, get your butt on over to Crunchyroll and give them the money. Give them the money because, as Matt knows very well, if you don't give them the money... You get about 75,000 commercials every time you watch any kind of show, which completely just makes you never want to watch a show because it's stupid. But if you buy in and you get to watch all these shows, just boom, as they're coming out, and then you go back and watch ones that came out like the last year, like the, the Your Lie in April, that was like a last year title, but I popped it on. I got to binge watch that entire thing, and let me tell you, man, that story was phenomenal. I actually had more emotions in that thing than I have in almost any game I've played in years, so I gotta tell you, that's gotta be my last honorable mention because I had so much fun, even after gaming and having a great time watching some anime, or the nights where I just wasn't feeling it, or the 3.45 a.m. mornings where you're like, I don't have the mental capacity to pop a game in, I need to just binge out and watch something. This form of entertainment has quickly and weirdly become like one of my favorite forms of entertainment, besides gaming. And, of course, reading, but reading's completely fallen off because it's so hard to do at any time, given point and such. So this has pretty much taken my second form of favorite thing to do in the entire world. So I've got to mention it. And I've got to tell you, get into some anime. There's so much good stuff out there. And if you like sports, doesn't matter. Anything you like, it's there. 
even video game stuff. If you just want to, oh, I want to watch video game stuff. They've got Final Fantasy anime. They've got all sorts of different Persona anime. That's out there for you. All of it's there. You can get anything you would like in some anime. And just got to bring it up. Because you know what? It's part of my life. It's something that pretty much consumed more time than almost anything this year. And there it is. This is disgusting and I hate you, Eric. So I got five more honorable mentions, which is all the wrestling matches I saw, (laughs) all the movies I went to see, all the plays I went and saw, musicals, uh, my favorite radio station in the the car. No. So I'm going to go back to actual video games with my last honorable mention. And... I feel bad with, for this one being so low, but I played it so early in the year that now these specific memories are starting to fade. And I also feel bad because I always put an indie game right up near the top because I've been playing some awesome indie games. Every single year I play awesome indie games, and there's usually one up in the 2 or 3 position. And I, when I finished with Genesis Noir, I thought to myself, this is it. This is going to be my number 2 for this year because it was so mind-blowing and it's it's hard to explain what genesis noir is if you don't remember it's like that jazzy noir style but it's dealing with astronomical concepts like literally like the story is that of the big bang and how things come together but it's presented in such a strange way of where you are this man going through and like investigating all these like seeds of planets and seeds of stars and then things that are happening between people in these different scenarios. It's like all these little scenarios, little little vignettes of things that you go through and you're kind of piecing together the timeline leading up to the event that started off the plot. And each one of them, it's so stylish. It's so cool. It's so unlike anything else. A lot of them are super musical. When you you have like a little jazz battle with a street musician, he's strumming away on his bass and you're playing a saxophone. And the way the, the whole scene reacts to the music and it's just it's incredible and the thing that i won't spoil is towards the end things go completely just nuts there's that's that's all i'll say and the the like the astronomical science aspect comes in like it's all been kind of fantasy based it's it's kind of like dreamy this whole scenario you're going through but then like hard science starts coming in too it kind of reminds me of braid because braid is that you know, it, it's dreaming. There's this fantasy world, but then there's actual real life human concepts that kind of come in in the little books you read in there. It's kind of sprinkled in here. And then towards the end, it just, it all compresses and then poof, explodes in this just delightful thing. I can't, I won't even spoil what is so delightful about this section compared to the rest of the game. But when you play it, you know, when you see it with your eyes and you take it all in, it's just, it's, it's unlike anything else. So it's sad for me to put this as an honorable mention because I want to put it at the top, but there's so many other awesome games that are on my list. So that wraps up the honorable mentions. Give me your number five, Eric. What you got? All right. Sitting here at number five, we've got Strangers of Paradise Final Fantasy Origins. This title, I don't know why I was in from day one, Matt. I just felt it in my bones that I wanted to play this game. Probably because I'm hungry for Final Fantasy. You know, I always am digging a Final Fantasy title. But I was weird, you know, I was cautious about this one. Because, of course, it wasn't just made by Square, you know, Square Enix, etc. It was uh, the you know the folks over at Team Ninja and all that helping out here. So I'm like, what the hell are, are, am I getting into? Well, what I was getting into was a crazy, crazy, like... Not Souls-like game, but that brutal-type combat, you know, where you got to learn to parry, dodge, use the proper attacks, all that. All that's here. And, of course, you're going in as freaking Jack. And Jack is like an operative for this, like, weird side of the world who's trying to control this this part of the world to keep things in balance. At least that's what they claim. And then, of course, you join up with Jed Nash. And then from there, you're going in this kind of linear path where you go in, boom, 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 the king's like, hey, we don't trust you. You go do a mission, and then you pick up Neon, who's another wonderful character who actually was an operative before, but kind of felt like it wasn't real, like something was up. So we decided to take on the persona of Chaos herself, failed to do it. Jack picks her up as a teammate. They go back. The story goes on and on. But what I love about it is each area you go to is a play on every Final Fantasy. So it'll have like little bit of theme from every different Final Fantasy 
all the way through the levels. And then the music you hear will be like re remakes or re reconstructs or just like a, a vibe from every particular Final Fantasy. So if you've played them all, or at least most of them, every time you get into a new level, a new area, you'll be like, oh, it's Final Fantasy VI, oh, it's Final Fantasy VII, Final Fantasy IX, Final... so on and so forth. You get that vibe, you get that music hitting your ears, and you go, I remember this song. And just that alone made the game extremely fun. And of course, I played it on normal, so there was a learning curve. Because you get to have two different uh, you know, builds at once, so you can be like a dragoon and a mage, you know, and there's a billion of different job skills available to you, and you'll unlock more and more as you go throughout the game and as you level them up. But you have to go into combat knowing what's best. And most of the time, you can get away with, you know, the, your two favorites, but there's occasional bosses where it's just, you will not succeed unless you are a uh, a red mage, you know, or a, or a, or a white mage because it'll be some kind of uh, uh undead dragon and you got to be able to cast heals, you know, the old trick of casting heals on the undead. That stuff all comes into play and you have to make sure you're aware of it and then adjust to that. And yes, some bosses require you to parry and do all that stuff which a lot of players don't like and find, you know, unattractive. But I found it just fascinating. A ton of fun. I love Jack. So simple. And, of course, the memes are everywhere about him. You can go see him anywhere you want. You know, well, I want to kill chaos. It's like kind of his whole mantra. But everybody else like around him is like, hey, Jack, you know, you're all right, dude. Calm down, brother. And just the camaraderie and the connection between them as the game goes. And then, of course, the mystery figure of Astos, who's like this dark elf lord, who's working for... The same company Jack's working for, but is on his own agenda. And then the interplay between those two characters and how everything pans out. And then the fact that, I won't spoil too much, but I'll just say time gets involved. So it all starts to get really weird and crazy and and how you know each other and what's happened in the future and the present and the past. I had a great time with it. I loved it. Yeah, the graphics weren't like blowing my mind or nothing like that, but the music was freaking great. And the gameplay was just fun. I had a couple bosses I got stuck on and got frustrated with, but I eventually beat them and overcame it. And it felt great when you did that. You know, it just, it was like, oh yeah, that's it. And that's the same feeling I get for some other games we might talk about. But for this one, definitely deserves to be where it is. Had a great time with it. I wish more people would have liked it. It kind of bums me out that it kind of got like punched in the, you know, kidneys and guts as it did. But I don't think it deserves the hate it got. And if you actually go look, look, you'll see that plenty of people did enjoy it too. So, you know, if you're interested, check that out. Number five for me. And number five for me is a game from a series that neither of us are fans of. This game series tells stories that just don't really speak to either Eric or I. It's a game I was never going to play. Uh, I, I saw some trailers of it and I went, that looks pretty cool, but I don't like the series, so it's not for me. But then it showed up on Game Pass and I was playing some Game Pass games and just playing the same kind of games over and over. And I went, I need a break. And so I played Life is Strange True Colors. And now I am a Life is Strange fan because of this game only. I'll give you the basics of the story just like Eric did. You play as Alex Chen, who is going across the country to live with her brother in a small town in Colorado. She's got a troubled past. You know, you, you learn more about it throughout the story. I won't spoil anything. But she's really unsure and is really nervous about going here. She's not sure how her brother's going to be, how this town is going to be, how the people are going to interact with her, especially because she has these emotional powers inside of her. And when she encounters strong emotions, sometimes it kind of takes hold of her. And so she's she's not sure what to do. So it was interesting in that She's kind of trepidatious, as people say, about going to this new situation, this new scenario. And that's what I was, too. I was playing it going, I'm not going to like this game, but I'm going to try it. And then, just like Alex did with the town, I fell in love with the game, with the characters, with the town, with the scenario. I went in expecting absolutely nothing. To see the game's all about emotion, but I was like, ah... But I cared about every single one of those characters. I cared about Alex and her journey. When you had to make the hard decisions, it was hard for me to do. And and I have to give a lot of that to the motion capture, the facial capture especially. I don't know who it is that did her facial capture, but the way her eyes move, the way she looks, like the way she acts, 
it feels it'll sound silly to say this, but it feels real. Like obviously the characters are kind of cartoony, but the characters look and move right. And it helps you get sucked into there when you're having these emotional conversations or even just when you're hanging out with your friends. It looks right. It doesn't look goofy. It doesn't look strange. And then all the twists and turns the story can take, the the choices that you can make, helping out your friends by accessing their emotions. And Alex learns to kind of control it and help people with their emotions. If people are really happy, she can draw it out and make it great. People are really down. She can see what they're seeing to help them work through it and get past it. And it's just a, a beautiful story, a beautiful town, beautiful people in it. The climax was just so intense. I've never had a, a moment like that in a video game because it's, it's just a dialogue between two characters. But the way it's shot, the way it's framed, the way it's presented is so intense. And the fact that who it is you're talking to and what happened and what you're talking about, it's incredible. So just a phenomenal game that I absolutely fell in love with. I'm not going to spoil anything. I will also say the uh, the live action role play segment is amazing. And if you don't fall in love with Steph, like I said, incredible characters. I went back and watched some some reviews, some trailers of this to kind of get back in the groove and remember why I loved it. And just like I've said before with Persona 5 and with uh, Cyberpunk 2077, when I saw those characters, I could feel my heart skip a beat. Like, oh, it's my old friends. Oh, it's my old girlfriend. There she is. So if that game could provide that much of an emotional connection with me, it's got to go on the list. It's only number five this year, but a fantastic game, Life is Strange True Colors. Mm-mm. And that's not a bad pick. We've talked about that. I've always wanted to get into Life is Strange, so even tried. Maybe, you know, you say this, and you've said it before, maybe I give it another shot. Maybe I go take a peek at this one, because I want to like them. I really do. And a game that I shouldn't have liked... But I end up loving. Number four, Matt. Cult of the Lamb. It's got to be in here. It ended up at number four. What a game. I don't like town building games. Never have. It's never been my thing. But I saw the the material, you know, the, the essence of the game. You getting a second chance, the lamb, to worship this fifth weird deity that just wants to come back and has been imprisoned by its fellow gods. And I'm like, oh, hell yeah, this sounds great. And, of course, it's got all those weird satanic references and just dark things going. And then you can indoctrinate. Instead of becoming friends with the locals, you indoctrinate them into your cult. And then you can make them do whatever you want. And just naming them after people at work, naming them after friends, and they just weird, dumb things these creatures would do because you told them to or just naturally – all the laughs in the world. So much fun. That going out and actually doing the missions, which was also fun, and it wasn't like it was by no means was it Hades. So like you're not going out there and you're not getting these really cool dynamic sets and build up build ups and, and builds or whatever. You're not doing that. You are getting some builds and, and doing little like it's like a fraction of what Hades says when it comes to the roguelite go out and adventure. But that's not the game. You're only out there to get the resources you need to get back to your town and build the town up further and get more individuals indoctrinated into your cult so you can make more things and build yourself up to be even better, be stronger, get your uh your you know your uh, shrine bigger and better, get the uh they got the indoctrination like a uh, little uh loudspeakers going so i start placing those all over the camp and it's just constantly going worship me worship me worship me and then your little guys get the little swirly eyes and then they just start working day and night and twice as hard as they should be because they want to just do what's good for you you can't beat that and then you go into your freaking your chapel and you can be like hey you know what we need to sacrifice bob and that'll make you guys all happy and you'll work for me for a week with no complaints Great, this is the best. Kill him, and then I get benefits. It's so cool. And But then they also have, like, negative traits where, like, some of your members, if you kill somebody in front of them, they'll freak out and lose faith in you. But that's fine, because then you just kill them, too, get rid of them, bury them properly, tell your others to go pray over them. Or you even have options to, like, take them aside and just basically brainwash them with, like, mushrooms and stuff. And then they're all, oh, actually, I do love you. Wee. Just the dark, weird humor and how you can treat your members and 
and how you build the town and just become so powerful that the game becomes pretty easy if you really go to town with it. But the synergy between going out on the missions and then hanging out in town and getting these followers and then not to, just not to mention the side characters, you know, the NPCs, you go to the fishing area and there's this weird fish guy going, you know, teaching you how to fish. And then if you fish up enough things for him and do enough stuff for him, he gives you these pieces, which allows you to, of course, make your town bigger. And the same with this weird mushroom dude who's like cracked out on the mushrooms, but he's got everybody else like super possessed by him and it like kills them and he doesn't care. And he's, he's like super suspicious that you're actually going to, you know, do something against them, even though you're not. And so just that all these different NPCs, all extremely unique, all extremely fun. All of them have these weird quirks. And even the four like different gods, the deities that you got to go destroy to get, you know, to yours and let him go are like super cool and they'll come up like mid mission while you're in a minute and I'm like, Hey, listen, you know, why are you doing this? You know, we've actually locked them away for a good reason. What, what, what are you doing? And some of them are arrogant and say they're going to murder you. And they, you know, and so, I won't spoil it all, but they, they start to interact with your actual cult and do things and manipulate things. And a lot of cool, fun ways. The boss fights were great. The music, mm, chef's kiss, like them beats. Oh, I could just put that on repeat and play or watch or do anything else and i'd have a great time with it so cult of the lamb definitely a surprise for me this year you know i I was interested in it but it was one of those i thought for sure i'd probably just go yeah i should play that and then just go away and i'd never touch it instead ended up being number four what a great game i wish more people played it but uh you know even got somebody at work who doesn't play video games to play it so i guess that's a win all in all right that's right and your number four is a game you shouldn't have liked that you, you kind of stepped outside of your comfort zone and played it and had a great time with it that's what my number four is also and i'll probably get a lot of shocked faces when i say what this number four is because i just watched a video of a whole team given their game of the years and everyone complained because they couldn't pick the same game so the first guy got it and they all they all went this is the only game for game of the year. This is the only option. And it's my number four here, and it's Elden Ring. I've never liked the Souls games. I've, we've talked about it before. I played Demon Souls back in the day and hated it. Just it, well, This is not fair. It's impossible. Uh, every time I heard people talk about Dark Souls or Bloodborne or, or Sekiro, I'd go, Man, this is that, that's stupid. Why would you want to play a game that's hard? That just sounds ridiculous. And that's, that's what it got ingrained in my head. These are just hard for no reason. It's impossible to do. You just got to scratch and claw and fight and scrape your way through it. And then we started seeing Elden Ring, and we picked it up. And what stands out for me on Elden Ring is it's not the difficulty. Yes, it is hard. Steve said it before in his honorable mention. It is a difficult game. You do have to know what you're doing. But it will. it's also super flexible, especially Elden Ring. I can't speak to any of the Dark Souls games. But what did I say all the time when we talked to Howard or to Steve or to anybody or just into the microphones about Elden Ring? The beauty of it is if you find a spot that's too hard, you can just get on your horse and go away. You can go do anything else. And there were a lot of nights where I was not in the mood to fight a hard boss. I did not want to scratch and claw my way through this area with the stupid marionette dudes that were so hard for me to deal with, especially early in the game. And I was go, you know what? Okay, I've got, I've got a little sight of grace here. I know where it is I need to go. But tonight, I am getting on torrent, and I am just running around. I'm exploring. There's a cliff out there that looks real cool. I'm going to go over there and see what's over there. And I'd always find something. I'd find a cool area, a cool vista. I'd find a cave, and I'd go in the cave, and then I'd fight all these cool enemies, and then I'd find a boss, and that boss would actually be pretty easy for me to take down, and I'd feel accomplished because I went and did something. And even if I didn't find a boss or fight a thing, I would find such amazing areas, such wondrous things. I found, you know, the big elevator down, and then you're fighting the giant ants that are so disgusting and hairy and creepy and gross. There's so much in this game. Even if you don't want to do everything, if you don't want to fight every hard boss, You can do so many awesome things in this game, but when you fight those hard bosses and you overcome, it feels like nothing else. Like there's so many games out there that are hard, you know, like spectacle fighters like Bayonetta or Devil May Cry. But the beautiful thing about this compared to those is when you play those games, your character is strong already. You have access to pretty much most of the moves. You can do cool stuff. When you start Elden Ring, you can't do Jack. 
But as you, the player, level up your skills and you can figure out the tells and you can get your dodge timing right, then your character is also leveling up as you play. So, oh man, I really am not good at dodging. I'm not good at timing the magic stuff. Okay, well, if I'm not good at dodging, I need a big shield. Thunk. Now I got a big shield. Oh, well, my stamina still goes down. I need better armor. Dunk, 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 dunk. All right. So you evolve, your character evolves, and like I said, the flexibility of it. My Elden Ring playthrough will be not like anybody else's Elden Ring playthrough. Eric played as a magic person. I played as the big stone rock guy. Shay played as something totally different. I don't even know what Jared played as, but I guarantee his journey through Elden Ring was nothing like anyone else's. That's what I love about this game. And now talking about it, I wish I had put it higher on the list, but there's so many other good games too. It's just, it's so flexible. It's, it's more than just being difficult. You have the option to do so many things. And if something's not working out for you, if you want to be a wizard, but you just, it's just not working for you, you can go back and respec or just start putting points into other things. You know, my, my shield it was doing great, but my sword sucked. I hated not having enough range. So what did I do? I went out and I found a halberd. Now I got the range and it's working with the shield. Everything was working out great. So it's a game I will always encourage everyone to play. You have to play Elden Ring. It's like nothing else out there. It's so flexible. You can do so many things in it. And if you don't want to do all the hard fights, you don't even have to do it. You can have a wonderful time just seeing the creatures and seeing the the vistas and the lay of the land. It's a it's a beautiful and a wonderful game. And it's my number four this year. Mm-mm, number four. Well, you know what? At number three, Matt, this isn't an improper chopper for you, but it is for me. But I could not let it go. I couldn't. That's Yakuza Like a Dragon sitting there at number three. You know, I hate putting games that are old on the list. You know, they're, they're old games. People already played these a year ago, two years ago in, in some instances. But I'm like, Eric, you put 90 hours into this bad boy. And you enjoyed every minute of it. You just loved it. Loved it to death. Except for when I got stuck with the money. But then I broke through that because I finally said, let's go. Let's go. Let's go over here with Ichi and let's go to the Ichiban confections and make this something. And then, of course, Ari comes into the picture, you know, and then boom, all of a sudden I'm just smoking through here. I'm getting money like nobody's business. She joins my team, a totally... Random character who you didn't have to get at all, didn't have to do anything with, but now she's on my team, and it just boom went off from there. Just instant love, instant love before that, but after that was just the stars were the limits. You know what I mean? You had infant source of income, you had a cool new character, the story was fantastic. Just uh, just the environment itself. I I had so many fun nights just wandering around. I was just grinding. Yeah, just go grind, hit here, finding the, uh, the, what are those little coins, the little clan coins? Oh yeah, the Tojo clan. Yeah, I'd go find the little Tojo clan coins. I had, I wouldn't even care if I was doing anything else. I just, you know what? That's in an area I haven't really just kind of like scoured before. Let me go do that. I'd get in every single fight along the way. Don't care. Whatever. I'll smoke them all because the combat was RPG fashion and it was over the top and ridiculous. So your characters are over here. Baseball bats doing all home run hits. You know, you got, uh, you, <laughs> you got some characters pulling out like hairspray and spraying their eyes. And it was just so cool. And then all the characters that were with you, you just, you instantly fell in love with them. You know, except for Nambu, you know, Nambu, I don't, I still don't trust you, but whatever. You know what I'm saying? I guess a lot of people still have love, but I don't know. I don't forgive so easily. But the others loved all of them. Dachi. That's my homeboy. You know, he he's the one that's going to go thick and thin for the rest of your life. He was never moving, never budging. Such a great cast of characters. And I really wish that my only my only gripe about this game was that I wish you'd have got, um, uh, what's his name? The, um, oh, I'm forgetting it. I'm forgetting it. He came so late. He came so late in the game and it bugged me. Sword guy or gun guy? Sword guy. I forget his name too. June, but he, June, he, June. No, that's, no, the, that's the sword. That's guy. the gun guy. That's, that's the Junkie Han, yeah. Yeah, well, man, I don't want to forget. See, but that's why this upsets me because I didn't. Uh, Zhao. Yeah, Zhao, yeah. Yeah. Like, I wanted to love him. And he was so cool in all the moments you get to interact with him throughout the story. But he came in so late 
that I had already had, I had already formed my bonds. I had already formed my teams, and I was like, I don't know if I really want to pop you in right now. I'm kind of end game. Ah. I had that same moment, but I said, No, Adachi, you're out of here. This guy is too oh, cool. You and got we, rid were just, of no. we were just, we were just. It was me, Junki Han, Zhao, and whatever her name is. I forgot. I'm blanking on her name too. She was the heel pot, and then we were just, we were just damage McGee. I don't need a tank. I'm just, I'm just rolling through, cutting up, shooting up, break dancing. Ooh, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, Psycho Makoto, Makota, or whatever. Psycho, yeah. Psycho, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. I just wish he would have came along because he was so cool and I wanted him on my team. But since I had already formed my teams and had, had a really good synergy going with uh, heal tanks, damage, etc., and I was I was able to get Drew in there or whatever. But you know him, I just couldn't do it. And even though Aerie came in late, I have a soft spot for the female characters, so I, I was like, no, I got to get her in here. So I just power leveled her up, and uh, she ended up having a move, and I don't remember what it is anymore. But she had a move that was like. Decent damage, no matter what the enemy type was, no matter what they were immune to, always did like just fundamentally good damage. And so I couldn't not have her at the very end of the game because I was able to basically cheat. You know, I was just, I'll oh, just cast this over and over with her. And even if some of the other characters were screwed on what they were doing, it didn't matter. They were still hitting and doing a lot of damage. So, gotta say, music good. Environment just fantastic. New characters, such heart, and then of course Ichi with his his voyage, you know, for his old boss, and how that all plays out, and how you get to see what happens at the end, and and what all went down, and how it went down, and just the relationship between some of those characters. Man, that was wonderful. And then there was the moment where another character came in, whom I'm not familiar with, as I've already said before, but I understand the importance of it, and I was like, oh wow, man, this is sweet. Can't wait to see this. And then of course that was. That was promised when they released trailers for the next game, and I was like, "This is it. This is gonna. This next title is gonna freaking be so damn good. I can't wait to play it." So even though it's an old game, and I don't like putting them on here, I put too much time into this and had too much fun with it, and I feel like I'd just be like e- erasing a part of my favorite part of the year if I didn't. So it has to be sitting at number three this year. Yakuza like a dragon, man. And I'll tell you what: if you like RPGs or you like Yakuza, or you just like a damn good story. This is a good game to play. Now, for my number three, uh, I'll tell you, sometimes on these lists, we do fakesies. Ah, this, if you follow Eric's rules, it technically shouldn't be on here. If you follow my rules, maybe it shouldn't be. But no one has ever cheated like this before. Because my number three is six games. <laughs> it's all the Final Fantasy pixel remasters. And just like you said with Yakuza Like a Dragon, if I didn't have these on the list somewhere, I would be throwing away a big part of this year, a ton of playtime, and some of the best memories I've had in gaming this year. So every single Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster game is number three. That's one through six. And if you had if you had to press me to say, you know, pick one or two, for me personally, because the Super Nintendo era was, was the ones that I resonated with the most, I would say four or six, but then I'd also say five because I put so many hours into five leveling up all those jobs, you know, experimenting with a job system, getting all my stuff together. But then I'd also say, well, since I am old enough to have played the original Final Fantasy, I remember how janky and ugly and dorky sounding that game was. So to play that first as my first Final Fantasy Pixel remaster, it was incredible to see all the upgrades to that game especially. So if you make me pick one, I can't even pick one. I have to pick at least four. But they're all here... Obviously, everybody who's listening to this probably already knows. I streamed all these games 100% through on Twitch, uploaded them to my YouTube channel also. Having so much fun doing the voices, playing the characters, having crazy moments happen on stream, you know, just instantly nuking final bosses or like Final Fantasy (laughs) 2, getting hit with so many status ailments that you couldn't cure, and I couldn't figure out why, and it just ended up in a game over because everyone's paralyzed and nobody can get out because apparently you just can't get out in that game. But even so, (laughs) saying that, getting to experience that story, finally, for the first time for me, like obviously I had, I've owned like the Final Fantasy Origins collection and stuff, but I've never gotten into two or to three. So to finally get through those, to see those stories, to feel the, just like the slow development of the series throughout time. It was incredible. And it was, it was a ton of fun. 
I mean, if you watch my streams, I have a ton of fun just playing these games. So it was great to do it. Great to do them all in a row. To do it all this year, it was just phenomenal. And to cap off with one of my favorite games of all time, Final Fantasy VI. Just a, a wonderful time. I mean, I could pick out certain things of each one, but if you love Final Fantasies, if you love the original Final Fantasies, you owe it to yourself to play these games because this is the best they will ever look, the best they will ever sound, the best resolution you can ever play them in. This, to me, now is the definitive version of these games. I can never go back to the old ones. And I don't have to, because I have these, and every single one of them, despite my complaints with certain entries like 2 or 3, every single one of these is a masterpiece. When you get to the end, you feel like, damn, I went on a journey with this game, and I love these characters, or if there aren't characters, I love my team that I built, my my stupid little guys, when you, when you just have classes, like in 3 and in 1. But that team is my team. It'll be different from anybody else's team. But these, this is my team. These, this is my game. This is how I built these characters. I 100% completed every single one of these. And as much as I talk crap about it, it was not a chore because I got to experience six amazing games all in a row in a fantastic fashion. Just mwah, chef's kiss. Final Fantasy Pixel Remaster. Six games in my number three slot. Gosh, bless. I should be doing the grump face here, but I won't. You know what? If I can do some crazy stuff, I gotta let Matt do crazy stuff. It has to be that way, otherwise the synergy will fail and we'll all die. That's just the way it goes. But for me, sitting at number two, who this, this is where the big ones come in. That's, you know, you don't know what's gonna happen. Well, you kind of do, but God of War Ragnarok is the number two this year. I didn't think it was gonna be for sure. I for sure thought it was gonna be number one. But I had to sit long and hard and think about it. And it came in at number two. God of War Ragnarok was everything I wanted it to be. You, as Kratos, rock and roll, and Atreus is older. And then on top of it, you get to be Atreus this time around. And not only that, but he was actually badass. I, I think I don't know if I said it on show or just to you, but he's actually, to me, more fun than Kratos was. He's way more nimble, fast acting. You know, the way you could just do long range attacks instantly and then pop in and get some melee attacks in and the, the combinations and skill sets that you can learn and then give the points into to, you know, make yourself cooler. Just super awesome. The synergy was like fantastic with it. I just felt like a complete god when I played as Atreus. Now, of course, I did as, you know, Kratos too, just because of his just power, his pure strength. You know, there's nothing but boom every time you hit something it was flying it was getting punched it was getting hurt so i can't complain on any front when it comes to uh the characters you are and what you're playing as and then of course the story it just carries you along the entire way but at every other moment it stops and goes hey this is what we're doing man but then not only do you think it but the game will go hey father why don't we take a minute and actually go back and check out that cliffside that we saw? Because I'll bet there's something there we could get. So it tells you throughout the game, once again, I enjoy this kind of hand-holding because it feels it feels good when the game does it to you instead of the weird like, hey, the world's ending in 24 minutes. Oh my god. And then you're just like, nah, bro, I'm going to go spend 62 hours backtracking and messing around. This game incorporates backtracking where it's like, hey... Freya's waiting for us, but she's got things to do. We can get to her when we get to her. She's helping her brother out. It doesn't matter. How about we go back over here and explore and try to get this so we can come over there stronger than ever. That's the kind of thing that happens all throughout this game. So there's never a time where you're feeling like weird, like uh, I'm supposed to immediately be here because uh, this, you know, this this scenario is happening, but I'm just instead wandering around like an imbecile looking for every single nook and cranny to get every little treasure in the game. You don't get those moments because the game thinks about it before you do. And then the best part about Ragnarok was in the first one, you were Kratos. That's what you were. That's the way the game went. I already told you you play as Atreus this time. But not only that, this time you get... Oh, I don't know if I should spoil it, man. I don't know. I won't say nothing else. But you get other characters accompanying you along the way. So it's not just you. Yeah, there'll be a mission where it's you and Brock. There's a mission with you and, you know, single. There's a mission with you and such and such and such and such and so on and so forth. You're going to have personal times with several different characters throughout the game. And it really starts to build 
you know, that, 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 uh, that amicable feeling, you know, that camaraderie. You actually start to get to know the characters more than just the usual, like, uh, okay, it's NBC, you know, three, and they gotta go do the thing. And you're like, nope, I spent, you know, eight hours traveling with this character. And of course, the banter, which is what God of War is really big on with Mimir, you get that with not only Mimir, because he's there the whole time too, yapping and telling stories and talking about things, but you get it with the characters that you're with. And then Mimir also will talk about certain stories and scenarios that he had with this character, because of course, these are gods. They've lived for billions of years so they've got all this history that you don't have with them because you are obviously killing other gods in different time periods and doing different things so it's just sweet it's just so much fun to sit there while you're walking and just killing boring regular enemies which is still fun but you know what i mean to have mimir going oh tell them about the time that we went to the twins and then da, 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 and then this the, the banter the story that comes from it always a great time graphic wise just phenomenal I, I do have to say, you know, you can tell it looked like an up res God of War 2018. So you can you can tell they're not fully in the new, you know, PS5 era yet. They kind of went in between. But even so, man, it's gorgeous. It's just wonderful. The traveling system was still kind of, you know, janky. You had to go to the tree and then find the doors. While it was more streamlined this time, you just walk into the door to instantly pop up for you and you couldn't miss it. It still was a little meh, but other than that, I had no complaints, except for the one thing I already talked about at some point in time. I don't remember which show it was, but that ending where the apocalypse basically is coming. I gotta say, I wish they would have, I just, I beg and implore them to, if they make another one and they have a big event like that, just spend more time on it. You know, if the game's gotta come out later, so be it. But if you build up such a big event like that, Take the time to play it out. You know, let let you get the emotions, let you get the feelings, let you get the battles that should be there to make this an epic event because it was really rushed. And the whole game, I was just kind of cru- not cruising through, but like steadily going through, getting more powerful, more powerful, but backtracking because the game allowed me to. You get to this point and it was go, 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 end game end. And I was like, whoa, I just spent all this time with the game. And then Ragnarok, the final event, the big, big thing was just like, here's an hour of stuff and the game's over. And I was like, wow, man, it's kind of a weird buildup, you know, spending eight, nine hours in every single zone and every single area just to have the biggest, the biggest thing in quotes be like an hour and then the game was done. So phenomenal. I have very little complaints. The way they did your weapons and the additions to that system and how that all plays out just... Mm, 10 out of 10 the feeling of kratos battling just everything about it a magnificent wonderful game and of course some people complain saying it was more like a movie you know than it was a game and i agree there was a lot of just like scene and scene and scene and scene and bit but i'm over here smiling i'm having a great time i'm enjoying the hell out of it so what's there to complain about and in between you're actually playing as two gods smoking enemies having a good time and then they have the challenges of the uh they're not Valkyries, but the mad uh man, I'm slipping on what the name of those Yahoos were. But besides the Valkyries, there's another enemy type that you can go find and initiate battle with. And you don't have to if you don't want to, but if you want a challenge, you wanna actually have to sit there and like Dark Souls like learn a boss, they're there. That kind of fight's there for you. And I had a great time. I beat like eight or nine of them out of the twelve, I think it is, so I felt satisfied and I felt complete and I felt like my journey there was good, solid, and just a wonderful time. Can't recommend it enough. God of War, you almost made it to number one, but not quite this year. Now for my number two, I might catch flack for this one. And I will admit, yes, recency bias is a thing. Games I've played more recently kind of shine brighter in my memory than things from further in the past in the year. But my number two is in this spot for a reason, and that's a lot of the reasons that you just said for God of War. Bantering, back and forth, smiling and having a good time. When I think back on this game, I'm going to remember how much it made me smile, and that's high on life. It's my number two this year. For all the reasons that I've talked about, on the watch plans, on the show proper, this game is so funny. It's so much fun, and it makes me smile every time that I play it. Even if I'm just going around the levels, trying to find more lug locks to, to unlock more things. It's so much fun to walk through these colorful, beautiful environments with my little buddy, 
guns. Any one of them that's out, I look at them and it makes me smile. And then as we're walking through this area, or you know, I switch from one Gatley into a different one, they have a different voice line that comes out. Oh, hey, I know I'm not your favorite Gatley, and don't worry about it. I'm like, hey, no, I do love you, Gus. The gameplay is fairly simple. You're, you're walking around, you're shooting. The Metroidvania aspect of it was completely unexpected for me and just a complete delight. When I saw things that I couldn't access and I went, what the hell am I supposed to, how am I, what am I supposed to do with that thing? And then three, four hours later in the game, I got a thing that, you know, specifically lets you latch onto that texture on the wall. It clicked in my brain and I went, oh yeah, this is over there. I can't wait to go back there, get the thing and then go all throughout the rest of that level and find all the other spots where I can use this thing. And I did that every single time. I, every time I got unlocked a new ability, I would go back into the last level. I would go around and use it. And then as I used it, I would find things that, oh, when you're using, let's say, uh, Gus's discs, that's pretty early in the game. Uh, that's not a big spoiler. It's stick into walls and let you jump onto them. And you can use knifey whoosh, to grapple to them. But you would use Gus's disc to get up to something, but then there'd be something just out of reach. How do I get to this now? I've already got one step here, but there's another step beyond it. I love that kind of thing in games. I love Metroidvanias in general, like the Guacamelee games did that really well too. So to see it here in a game that I was already loving, just loving the colors and the spectacle of everything, just going through that town for the first time. It's so colorful. It's so bright. I'll just just the NPCs. They don't even have anything to say to you most of the time, but they're so bright and colorful. In an industry here where so many things are not bright and colorful and cheery, every time I play this game, I smile. It's it's like nothing else. And then, I mean, I've said it a million times before, but the humor. Every single time I play this game, I find something that makes me laugh. Even if it's a commercial on the TV that I've seen three times before, something will make me laugh. You know, whether it's just the outright silly commercial that they did. Sometimes it's the crazy voiceover. Sometimes it's the weird animation. Sometimes it's the fact that you could tell in the booth, because they kept it in the game, the actor was laughing as he was trying to get through his lines. I love stuff like that. I love when I can tell that you're having a great time, trying to let me have a great time. And I shouldn't say this, but there's a game that we're not going to talk about on the show ever again that was ostensibly a comedy that we played this year, and it was a miserable experience. So to play a game that is a comedy and makes me laugh and smile and feel great every single time I play it, that's a special thing. And it's got to be on this list. When I look back on it two years from now, maybe being at number two will be too high, but right now in my heart, this is my number two game of the year. High on Life is so much fun. It's so, it was so unexpected. I didn't expect to laugh nearly as hard as I have all the way through this game at so many different things. But then on top of it, there's so many little touches. You go to the pawn shop. Every single thing on that counter mm -hmm. has a little item description. Every single power up you can get for the Gatlians, it has a little description in there. You don't need, it doesn't need to be there. All it needs to say is, uh, let's Gus reload his discs faster. But then it says, let's go reload his discs faster and also helps him forget about how painful it is for him to shoot these out of his tiny body. And it makes me laugh every time seeing the different things. Even when I couldn't afford them, when I didn't have any money for upgrades, I would go and read every single one. Every time I find a vendor, I can't wait to see what he has as an upgrade for me in a gameplay sense. And then to see what the item description is, what's going on in this world. There's so many awesome moments. I'm not going to spoil them, but the Mac and Cheese Brothers, the bridge... The final Gatlian that you get, if you don't laugh at those three things, you got no soul. This game is full of heart and soul and humor and fun. It's high on life. God, I just want to go play it right now. It's so much fun. I love it. So bad. And the game, the number one, Matt, the one that gets the coveted gold Pokemon trophy. Here it is. Whew, worth a million bucks, probably. It's a wonderful game, and it it was not going to be number one. It wasn't going to be number one. But I had to stop with the bias. I had to stop getting mad about it and think about things. And that, and that's Elden Ring. It's Matt's number four. It's my number one. Because I have played Demon Souls, the original. And then I swore I'd never play one of these games again. Because it was too hard. It was too ridiculous. Too much. And then I tried Bloodborne. Played that for nine hours. Said, nope. 
you were right, Eric. You'll never play this game again. It's not it. This is not what you want. You don't want this game. And then Elden Ring came out, and it was a meme. It was a joke. Me and Matt, <laughs> boo, game of the year. <laughs> we don't even know what it is. Game of the year, <laughs> boo, because that's what all <laughs> the people were saying. And but <laughs> somehow we ended up getting lured in. And we're like, oh yeah, we got we got to buy it. We got to buy it. And we did. And I'll tell you, I won't go crazy because Matt already kind of just said what what there was to say about Elden Ring. But I'll just say that every moment in that game up to the fire giant just mystery wonder fun i'd get on and i didn't know what i was gonna do i didn't care i didn't have a plan i never had a plan i never got on i was like tonight i'm gonna go beat uh this guy and then move forward over here i went i'm gonna get on i'm gonna look at the map and i'm just gonna decide where to go and you know sometimes it led to a you know the story boss most times it didn't. Most times I was like, you know, I went through those woods, but I didn't actually scour those woods. I just rode through because I was trying to get to that hut where I knew the dude wanted the uh, the pickle. Go back to those woods and go comb it, you know, Boy Scout style, back and forth. And that's what I would do. And then sure enough, every time, just like you said, every single time there was a reward there was some kind of weird shenanigans. There was something there for you to interact with and or engage in to get a new reward to get something. There'd be a ghost. There'd be a giant bear covering a, a, a freaking hole that led you down into a little dungeon that got you a reward. That was always there. Without exception, you were always rewarded for every single place and every single thing you did in that game. Almost no games do that. Period. Period. I don't know how this game managed it. It's just unbelievable. And then just to hear about the millions of things I never did. Like apparently there's a you could go to sleep with a certain thing on a on a rock or something somewhere and it summoned like a three headed dragon or something like that. Who the hell would have thought or known to do that? How do you figure that out? I don't know. I have no idea. Was it some tome somewhere from a different dungeon that something said to like uh, sleep on Halsbury Rock with the stick of justice and it would unlock something. I don't know. But the mysteries and the weirdness of this game were just phenomenal. And then, like you said, playing as any character and anything you wanted to be and any combination thereof. Because you could be a, 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 a half mage. You can, you know, have a few spells, but it'll, you know, be there with your shield and sword or halberd or whatever the hell the, the case may be. You could build that character if you wanted to. There was incantations. There was spells. There was sorceries. There was all sorts of different things you could do and be. It was just, just amazing. I mean, it was just fantastic. The difficulty was the only thing that sometimes turned it down. And that's like when I hit the fire giant, I hit a brick wall. The reason why it came back as number one is because I thought about it. And like the whole year, I did nothing but complain about why I can't get past this damn fire giant and why I can't keep playing this game. Most games, if I had hit a wall like that, I'd have been like, oh, that was a great game. Whoop. And it's gone. I don't ever played it, finished it, and I just said, yeah, I had fun with it, didn't get through it. But the fact that it just kept, like, oh, man, I'm just mad about it. I'm mad. I want to play this game, but stupid games. Games are dumb. Makes me bad. Why can't I? I just, want to get, I just want to play this game. I whined about it all year because I wanted to play. I just got stuck. Just got my butt handed to me. There's a boss I just could not get past. Finally got past him. Got to have a great time finishing it up. Granted, I complained to Matt saying that the story is whack you know, at the end, but we've already known that. It, it was a, it's about the journey. It's not about the story. And as long as you keep that in mind, you're going to have a fantastic time with this game. As Matt said, if you got a chance, play it. Maybe you don't get all the way through, but it's an experience that I think you know gamers should check out because it's it's doing something all on its own. It's 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 definitely different, and I hope games follow suit and maybe not be as difficult, but definitely be as adventurous, be as mysterious, be as just unexpected as Elden Ring was, because I had the time of my life with this game, and uh, you know. I really wish they'd do like an Elden Ring 2, but that's not what's going to happen. He's already said no, so sad, but oh well. Here we are. It's going to be number one this year. I don't want it to be forgotten, which it won't be because a million other people chose it as number one. But I got to give uh, props where it's due. 
So your number one is universally loved, universally acclaimed. Everybody else is putting it on their number one. My number one game of this year is a game that I have literally seen people put on their worst games of the year list. Most disappointing, worst games, awful games you should never play. But I had a blast with this game. Now, uh, before I even get into it, I will say, if you play this on PC or I hear Xbox, I've heard that it's really buggy. So if you had a buggy experience with it, I understand why you don't like this game. I'm not going to invalidate your opinion, but you also can't invalidate mine when I tell you that Saints Row is my game of the year this year. I had so much goddamn fun with Saints Row, and I started off iffy on it. I started off iffy because it's brand new characters, it's a whole new scenario, it's a whole new city it's a whole new everything it's all brand new your boss is not the boss from all the previous four games your crew nobody is back but what i love is that you start off your boss has like a backstory you start off not as just the boss of the saints you start off as a marshall drone you have a job with marshall and you're trying to do it and trying to get it right and then you screw it up you lose your job you go back to your friends and now it's a problem Because you all live together in this apartment and you got to make rent. And sure, people have an issue with that. Like, oh, we're going to start a gang just because you can't make rent. What's the deal? But your boss feels like a part of this friend group. You can tell that these four are friends and have been living together. They have their own traditions. They have their own events that they like to do. They have their own personalities and they all interact with each other well. By the end of the game especially, I came to love every single one of those new characters. Nina, the way she saved my ass on that bridge, I will never forget that. Eli, drawing me into the dust moot. The second live-action role-playing quest-slash-scenario in a game that I've played this year that was incredible, that carried over so well into just the regular gameplay. I love the way they tied that in. I will always love Eli for that. Kevin being just a badass he he's not as good as johnny gat but he's he's almost there seeing him tearing through the idols being such a badass was incredible so loving the characters you go into the story maybe the story is not the greatest you know maybe i'm not going to remember the end villain for all time but guess what i don't remember who the main villain was in saints row 2 or saints row 3 but just everything you could do in this game it was a Saints Row game. You can customize your boss. You can customize your wardrobe. You can do everything that you could in the old games. You can customize all your vehicles. You can customize the hideout. And then all the activities coming back. Every time you would place a new business down, it would open up side activities all throughout the city. Some of them returning Saints Row activities like insurance fraud, always a classic. But so many of of them, even if they didn't hit immediately off the bat, the fact that it opened up new things to do around the city and it helped you become part of that city. I reinstalled Saints Row just last night to get back into the city and refresh my brain, just like I talked about with Life is Strange True Colors, seeing it again. And I got all the homies together. I got a four-door car and I went, we got in and I went, okay, I want to go find the stadium. And I didn't look at the map. I didn't open up, set a waypoint. I went, okay, when I leave the church, I go, right, I take this highway over, it's down on the south side, down off to the west, and I circled around and I went through the little Las Vegas area and there was Smelter Stadium. And I went, and I remember, right outside of here is Smelter Square, where one side quest took me for like half a second, and they built out this beautiful area. If you've ever been to a professional football stadium and you've seen the kind of stuff outside of it, and you go to Smelter Square, it is exactly that in this game. So when people say, the city is dead. The city is lifeless. You did not do the side missions because you will find so many cool things in the city, especially the photo hunt side missions where you go around taking pictures of things and it unlocks stuff for the church. You can customize with all these signs, with all these statues, with all these things you find out in the world. You find all these little corners of the city that are just themed so perfectly. That's the kind of thing that I absolutely loved about Saints Row. Yes, it's a brand new city and everything is fresh and new. And maybe not everything you can go and do, but when you explore around, when you go do those side activities, you find so many tiny things. They didn't have to put this in the game, but they made this little themed area. They made, Like I said, a side quest takes you out to Smelter Square for like five seconds. You go up, you start the activity, and you drive away. But if you take the moment to just explore around there, this game was made with love by people who love this kind of stuff. Volition, you did an awesome job with this. I posted up on Twitter... 
if you go explore the desert, there's collectibles out in the desert too. There are so many things you can find out there. The comb, the UFOs, the Wiley Coyote Tunnel. If you didn't find those and you say this game is empty and lifeless and boring, you did not do your due diligence. I did mine, and it made me love this game even more. It's funny. It's badass. It's silly. It's it's cool. It's serious. It's heavy. It's 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 fun in every single way. So many different weapon categories have different weapons based on the three different gangs that you fight, or just silly, crazy weapons. It's so much fun. Combat's a blast. Driving around's a blast. The radio stations are awesome. They have amazing music. Great commercials. It's everything you could want in a Saints Row game. If you love open world games like this at all, which obviously I do, last year my game of the year was Grand Theft Auto San Andreas Definitive Edition, you owe it to yourself to play this game. Download the latest patches. I know they're still working on hot fixes and patches for it, so if you are encountering some some glitches, which I did, I encountered a few, but they weren't ever game-breaking. The most it would take me back is like 30 seconds to the start of the mission, and I would load back in and continue having a blast. The last thing I'll say is, When I was done with this game, I instantly said, I am 100% completing this game. Let me find out what I need to do to do that. And I don't do that with a lot of games. I mean, I have done it with a lot this year, but not a lot of open world games. I loved this game. I loved the world. I loved the characters. I loved all just the fun memories and activities and everything that I got to do in Saints Row. So Saints Row, and it's it's fitting that the award is a cactuar statue because Santo Eleso is in the middle of a desert. So it's fitting. There, boom. Game of the year is Saints Row this year. I don't care if you hate me for it. I don't care if you turn the podcast off as soon as I said it. This is my list. This is the game that is going to live on in my heart forever from this year. It's Saints Row. It's the best game I played this year. Gosh dang it. Well, we did it, Matt. We let it out there for all the folks. Our top games of the year. And of course, we want to know, we already said it, we want to know what everybody else's top games of the year are. If you got them in now, we'd be putting them in right here. If not, hey, we can still get them in. I'd love to hear back and throw yours in on a future episode here, probably the next one after the next one, but pretty soon throw them in. Just because I love variety and I love seeing different people's tastes and where it took them, you know, the journey to get where they got and their gaming, you know, picks for the year. And since we're not like the big, 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 bigs, you know, and your usual normal folks, it's more interesting. It's cooler to see, you know, the the cool, weird little games that you don't, you know, you're not always seeing on the top five. It just has to be there because it is there. So get them into us because I want to know what everybody else's top five games were because I'm curious and I want to, hell, hey, I want to see if there's a game I missed, you know, some I should have played and didn't play besides the couple I already know about that I have to get on the list of get to as soon as humanly possible to make my life even more miserable with backlog. (laughs) I agree with basically everything you just said. This past two weeks on YouTube, I've been searching best games 2022 or, you know, game of the year 2022, because I love seeing everybody's unique take on what it is. I know we have people who listen to the show who are big racing game fans. Is Gran Turismo 7 on your list? Tell us why. I love just the different perspectives. Some people love Stray. Some people love this. Some people love that. I, lo- I love hearing that stuff. So send that to us. Send us your game of the year lists or maybe just your game of the year, whatever you want to do, to the email, thirdshiftme at gmail.com, on the Twitter machine at thirdshiftme, and find us on Facebook under Third Shift. Indeed, you can find us over there. You can also find us on the old Patreon. I like what we're doing, like what you hear. Want to send us into the new year rich and famous. Consider heading over there, throwing a tip our way, one, two, three bucks, five thousand bucks, or a million bucks, in which case we change our lives, which I don't know why we haven't taken it off there yet, because if it ever did happen, that'd be super weird. And I don't think a million bucks is actually enough to get us really going in that direction, and we'll end up failing and being poor and on the streets. But anywho, it's on there. So if you do it before we actually check it out and take it off someday, then uh, we'd have to follow through with that. So maybe just consider it. I don't know. But if you can't throw any bucks our way, hey, throw us your favorite games of the year, just like we said. Throw us something you want us to talk about in the next or the next episode or the episode after that. Throw us some kind of this, some kind of that. Tell us a funny story. I don't care. Or tell us a five-star story because you can also go over to them freaking spotify you can go over to itunes you can give us five star ratings you can tell us five star stories you can have all sorts of fun and entertainment and helping us out and and supporting us over on twitch give us that prime sub a million ways to help us out and not actually just go hey here's the cash 
we appreciate the hell out of it, but you can support us in other ways that does get us moving, keep us moving in a positive direction, so that way we can become infamous in the years to come. And speaking of the year to come, you can listen to the very next episode, the first one of the new year, going from our favorite episode of the year to our least favorite episode of the year, which you can find <laughs> on or before or around the 5th of January. You can find that on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Podbean, on Spotify, and on YouTube. And as I always say, hey, if you like what we're doing, you'd like to help us out, please give us a like, a rating, review, a comment, a subscription, any kind of good thing on any one of those good services, because it does help us out. And we really do appreciate it. Indeed we do. Just like we appreciate those five-star reviews I just talked about. Get over there. Come on. Five stars into the new year. Come on. Sympathy vote here. We got oh, we got a quarter in the tax and we're That's real true. sad. <laughs> we're real sad, man. Brighten up our spirits with the five-star review. Keep us going. You know, maybe we should put Game of the Year as like the first episode in January and put the resolution special like like the two months after, later I, like, like after, after all that, that like February. I was gonna say beforehand but we're going into it now so it'd still be bad and then yeah, I, I don't bad. know <laughs> once we're out of the weeds it'd be better like oh it's February 7th it's, now it's okay. what are you gonna do now that now, life's I'm, back I'm, to normal I'm gonna fix things up here we go instead of <laughs> no there's no hope life is over it's just death <laughs> But regardless, until we see you in the new year, everybody, there's nothing else to say but don't forget, forget, to, don't say forget to say Shut up and sit down.